Such a blessing to be in the house of God this morning. Amen. 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 I'm just so thankful, so appreciative for the opportunity that I have to be with you today. Uh, so many of you that I already know, I'm already acquainted with, so many friends and uh, that I love so so dearly and uh, that I've known you throughout the years. And I'm just so excited to be here and also the new faces that I get to see as I come back and see how that God is growing and causing this work to flourish. And uh, just my friends Angie and I watching them operate in ministry and uh, we went to school together. And so it's such a wonderful thing to see what God's doing through their lives and just this church as a whole. I just I'm so appreciative of every one of you and what God is doing in your life. Um, I'm telling you, I already just feel and sense that there's just a great liberty of God in this place, that God has already come and, and He's already began to minister to your heart this morning. I feel that, I sense that, uh, just through the praise and the worship and the exhortation. Uh, the presence of the Lord is here, amen? And uh, I believe that if you're saved, if you're a child of God, the presence of the Lord here. He's here to encourage you, to help you, to lift your heart today. Uh, I'm under no illusion that just because you're in the house of God on a Sunday morning, uh, that you may not be experiencing a season of hardship or a season of difficulty, a season of heaviness. Uh, but understand the Bible, the Word of God still tells us that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk. And they shall not faint. And so God has the ability uh, to lift you up today, to lift your heart back to heaven, to set your feet on solid ground, and to bring you to where it is that you need to be in your relationship with Him. And uh, as Matt has, has exhorted you and as the worship team has sung this morning, uh, maybe you're here this morning and there's bondage in your life. There's things in your life that you know are not pleasing to God. The Spirit of God is here to set you free. He's here to help you. He's here to walk with you. And so I'm so thankful for the liberty of the Holy Ghost that I just sense and I feel in here today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter number 13. The book of Acts, chapter number 13. And while you're turning there, I just want to once again just say how thankful I am to be here. I'm thankful for Pastor Matt, Sister Danielle. And all that God is doing through their lives. They've been great friends to me, great supports to me over the years. And uh, the Lord has really used Matt to have a great impact and influence upon my life and upon my walk with God. And I'm just thankful for the opportunities that he gives, that he's given me today. But also as a young minister in the gospel, when I was just getting started to really begin to exercise my gift and do what God had called me to do. Um, he's just a great blessing to my life. I want to minister to you this morning a subject uh, simply entitled, Obstacles That Can Be Overcome. Obstacles That Can Be Overcome. Acts chapter 13, and we're going to begin reading uh, in verse 2. Uh, we'll read a couple of verses and then we'll skip down a little bit and uh, we'll read maybe 8 or 10 verses as we begin this morning. Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate or set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to do. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. And so they, speaking of Barnabas and Paul, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And then go down with me to verse number 6. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. I want to read verse 8 again. But Elymas the sorcerer, withstood or opposed Barnabas and Paul, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set or fastened his eyes upon him, and said, O fool of all subtility and mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. 
And immediately there fell on him this false prophet, a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine or the teaching of the Lord. The Christian life is never one that is uneventful or one that is unmarked by seasons of great trial and testing. <laughs> seasons of difficulty and hardship are not unfamiliar or foreign places to the believer in Christ. There are spiritual forces that are arrayed against the believer in Christ that are presently active and they are seeking to rob the believer of what he has been given in Christ and to hinder that believer from being the testimony of Jesus that he has been called to be. Threaded all throughout the scriptures are stories of men and women who loved God deeply, but yet they were opposed greatly. The psalmist would say in Psalms 34 and 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Jesus himself would say in John 16 and 33 that in this world you shall have tribulation. Paul the apostle would tell us in Ephesians chapter 6 that you and I do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And the word wrestle there in Ephesians 6 literally means to struggle. It speaks of a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so it is no secret that as a believer in Jesus, especially one who has set his heart to do the will of God and to walk in the purposes of God, there is no question, it is no secret that we are engaged in a fight. There is no secret that we are engaged in a combat. And so the question is never, will these seasons of opposition come? Because the testimony of Scripture and the experience of our own lives testify to us that these seasons will, in fact, come. Yes. Yes. But what I want you to see throughout the Scriptures is that with every promise and assurance of trial, testing, and temptation also comes the promise of God's supernatural and divine intervention. Yes. The psalmist said, Psalm 34 and 19, we quoted the, the first part of it a minute ago. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But he goes on to say, the Lord delivers him out of them all. Yes. Jesus, John 16, 33, in this world you shall have tribulation, but... Be of good cheer, for I have already overcome the world. Paul would say in Ephesians 6, we wrestle against these principalities and powers, but that you and I have available to us the strength of God Almighty to walk through every season of hardship and to overcome every obstacle that we face. And I want you to understand that with the promise, the assurance, of God's supernatural and divine intervention comes the ability that you and I need to be victorious, Hallelujah. to be conquerors, to be yes. overcomers, to be testimonies for Jesus, yes. regardless of what hell throws our way. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. And I just want to minister to you this morning yes. a message simply entitled, Obstacles That Can and Are Meant to be overcome. Yes. Obstacles that can and are meant to be overcome. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh God, we come before you today in the name of your Son, Jesus. Father, I am so humbled and, and grateful for this opportunity, Lord, that I have to deliver the Word of God today. Father, I thank you for your presence, Lord, that has been so tangible in the service already. Lord, from the moment that I walked into this building, God, I could just sense that this was a holy place, a place where God's presence, Lord, resides and moves in the hearts of his people. I'm so thankful for the liberty and the freedom that we feel in the Holy Ghost today. And Father, I'm just praying that in the next few moments, God, Father, that you would give me the tongue of the learned God, that I would know, Lord, that I would be able today to speak a word in season to those who are weary, God. Yes. I'm asking, Lord, that you would give each and every one of us, God, eyes to see 
ears to hear, and a heart to receive what the Spirit is saying to this church in this time and in this hour. And God, when it's all said and done, as we do now, we'll be sure to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Acts chapter 13 begins what you and I now label or now know as the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, where God would use Paul along with many others to begin to take the message of the gospel uh, to much of the Gentile world. You know the Apostle Paul, the beginning of this text, he's referred to as Saul, but later on the Bible says that he's also referred to as Paul. Paul was that man who was born again miraculously by the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 9. He was a man who was so opposed to Christianity, to the people of God, to those who bore the name of Jesus, that the Bible says that before his salvation, that he was literally breathing out threatenings and slaughters. This was a part of his life. It, it's, it's like oxygen is to the natural man. Paul felt as though he could not live without opposing and persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. He was literally breathing out out threatenings and slaughter against the Lord Jesus Christ and against his church. But on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is miraculously saved. He's born again. He's transformed by the Spirit of God. And in the same story in Acts chapter 9, Paul is then filled with the Holy Spirit and, and he begins to receive clarity from God as to God's purpose and God's plan for his life life. Ultimately, a plan that would entail the glorifying of Jesus. God tells Paul through Ananias that I'm going to use your life to bear my name to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the children of Israel. I'm going to take you. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. And I'm going to enable you to be a witness and a testimony for me to the furthest corners of the world. Yes. And God would also relate to the, to the Apostle Paul that with this call, God would make it clear to Paul that with this call would come great measures of opposition yeah. and persecution. Right. The moment he's saved and filled with the Spirit, God through Ananias first tells him he's going to be a witness for Jesus. And secondly, he says, I'm going to show Paul what great things he's going to have to suffer for my name's oh, sake. Oh my and so after receiving the call, after receiving clarity as to what it is that God had ordained for his life, God begins to prepare the Apostle Paul. And as a means of preparing Paul, God sends him away for a short season. And it's in this season, which some believe were, was the shortest three years, some believe could have been as long as ten years, but it's, it's in this season where many believe that God began to reteach yes. the Apostle Paul. He begins to reveal to Paul uh, the revelation of Christ from the Old Testament Scriptures. At that time, there was no New Testament. Right. and all, all the Apostle knew, uh, all Paul knew at this time was the Old Testament Scriptures. He was skilled in the Old Testament Scriptures, but there was a problem. Before Christ, he did not see the Old Testament Scriptures in light of Jesus Christ. But in those few years... As Jesus had spoke to his apostles in Luke 24, his disciples in Luke 24, God begins to reveal to Paul that the purpose of the Old Testament scriptures, starting with the Pentateuch, going through the Psalms and the prophets and all of these various portions of Old Testament scripture, he begins to reveal to Paul that these were all intended to show you and I, number one, our need for a savior, and number two, to show us God's answer for our salvation, yes. that being Jesus and what He would do for us at Calvary's cross. And so after this season of God 
preparing the Apostle Paul, reteaching him things about Jesus that he needs to know. I believe it was a season of great preparation and things that God began to shape and to mold into his life. Not just doctrine, but the ability to walk with God in faith and to overcome opposition and obstacles that came against his life. But after this season, Paul sends Barnabas to seek for Saul. The Bible tells us that Barnabas set out to Tarsus and he went and he found Saul. And then we get to Acts chapter 13 and we find that Paul and Barnabas are beginning to be commissioned and empowered by God to carry out the mission of bringing men to Jesus and establishing churches in the faith. To begin reaching unreached parts of the Gentile world. If you would read with me one more time, verse number 2. The Bible says, And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate or set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, the church laid their hands upon them and they sent them away. And so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia and went here and there and elsewhere. What I want you to see as you read these first three or four verses in Acts chapter 13 is that the mission that Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul, set out upon was not one that began with fleshly intuition or selfish mm -hmm. ambition. It was in fact initiated and propelled by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Yes. It was a divine call accompanied by divine strength. Yes. The Lord Himself spoke from heaven through someone there most likely and said, separate me. He made it very clear and distinct that it was Barnabas and Paul who was to be called to this particular mission. And so this mission was initiated and it was propelled by the Spirit of God. And their purpose for going was the Lord's purpose. And their power source in going, their strength, their ability to go was the Holy Spirit. It was the grace of God. Verse 2, God says, set them apart for the work that I have called them to. This is God's purpose. This is not sending them out to accomplish their own will, their own plans, and their own desires. This is God saying, set them apart so that I can use them to accomplish my will in the earth. Yes. And with that purpose and with that plan came the power of God's Spirit to accompany them. Because verse 4 says, they were sent out by the Spirit. Yeah. The church, yes, they acknowledged and yes, they blessed them and prayed for them on their way out. But it was the Spirit of God that anointed them and gifted them to carry out the mission at hand, which was the purpose of the Lord. And ultimately, God's purpose then and now can be wrapped up and described as twofold. Number one, it is the glorifying of His Son. And number two, it is the saving of men through the knowledge of His Son and all that that salvation entails. Yes. I want to say that again. That ultimately, God's purpose in the earth then and now can be wrapped up and described as twofold. The glorifying, number one, the glorifying of His Son. And secondly, the saving of men or the redeeming of men through the knowledge of His Son and all that that salvation entails. Oh, yes. Yes. Understand, God's purposes in and through our lives always involve the reconciliation of men to Himself and the building up of those same men by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. God's purpose in and through your life and mine, always without fail, involves the reconciliation of men to himself and the building up of those men by the Holy Spirit. Yes. This is not just for the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. This is for the Christian. Yes. Amen. Paul said that those of us who have been reconciled to God have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Right. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, that there should be something of our lives day in and day out that is drawing men to Jesus. Yes. 
If you're saved this morning, God's purpose for your life is to use your life to bring men and women to Jesus. Hallelujah. To bring the lost to Jesus and to use your life to enable, equip, and build up Christians in the knowledge of Jesus. This is why God has redeemed you. Yes. God has not redeemed you so that you might sit on a pew the rest of your life. God has redeemed you. He saved you for a purpose. Yes. God reconciled you through the blood of His Son Hallelujah. to Himself so that He might use your life to see others reconciled yes. to Himself. Hallelujah. We have been redeemed. And we are now giving, given, entrusted with the ministry of redemption, the ministry of reconciliation. And when man begins to cooperate, yes. when man begins to co-labor with God in that yes. purpose, yes. man can be assured of God's power. Hallelujah. Yes. When man begins to cooperate and co-labor yes. with God in his purpose, which is the reconciliation of all men to himself, then man can be assured of God's power. Yes. This is the very reason for which God sent to us the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Hallelujah. Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you so that you can be my witnesses yes. to the uttermost parts yes. of the world. Yes. You shall receive power yes. not to build up the reputation of man, but come to on. bring the name of Jesus yes. to reputation in every state, every country, every tribe, every village. Yes. You will receive power to be my witnesses. Yes, Lord. This is the reason for which God sends to us the Holy Spirit. It's so that we can be effective co-laborers with Him in His purpose. This is why God gives us the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's more than just a tingly, warm sensation. Yes. It is literally power from God to be the witnesses that He's called us to be and to do the work that He's called us to do. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, that I am what I am by the grace of God. Yes. And the only reason I can do what I do and the only reason I am who I am is because of God's grace. Grace, yes. God's yes. ability, yes. God's power at work in my yes. life. Yes. Yes. And so the Spirit of God comes to make us His witnesses in the earth. He comes not to build up the reputation of man, right. but He comes to help you and I make the name of Jesus of great reputation in the society, the community that we live. Oh, hallelujah. And when God finds a man or a woman who is consumed with this purpose. Yeah, yeah. When he finds a man and woman who is consumed with the purpose of glorifying his son, he infuses that individual with life and he anoints them to do exploits in the earth. Yes, Lord. Yeah. The book of Acts is not filled with stories of great men who made the name of Jesus great. Amen. The book of Acts is filled with stories of weak men yes. who were anointed by God's yes. Spirit to make the name of Jesus great. Hallelujah. The book of Acts portrays to you and I how that God can take very ordinary people and use their lives to accomplish extraordinary things Hallelujah. that bring glory to the testimony of Jesus. Yes. In Acts chapter 1, the, the apostles and the disciples were not the same as they were in Acts chapter 2. That's right. In Acts 1, they go into the upper room, they are weak, they are weary, and it seems as though their faith is slowly wasting away. But in Acts chapter 2, you find men anointed by the Spirit of God, willing to stand in the face of whatever adversity, opposition that comes their way, solely to keep the testimony of Jesus yes. Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They are no longer weak. 
They're men of great power. They're men of great influence. And it's not because their giftings or their characters or their personalities. It's because the Spirit of God has come upon their lives to make them say what they could never say in themselves. To enable them to do what they could never do in themselves. To be what they could never be in themselves. This is why the Holy Ghost comes. He comes in our weakness to make us strong. He is not drawn back by our weakness. He delights in our weakness because it's in our weakness that He can come and He can make us strong. If the apostles would have went into that upper room with the thought that we can do this by ourselves, they would have never received the power that God wanted them to receive. But they went in there with a recognition in their hearts that if we're going to do what He's called us to do, and we're going to be the church that He's called us to be, we need some sort of divine enablement accompanying our life. We need the power of God. And when there was a desperation in their hearts, God says, that's people I can fill and I'll use them for my glory. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Desperation always precedes mm. God coming in great power. Yes. Always. That's it. Yeah. That's it. When we realize that in ourselves we can never be who it is that He's called us to be, mm-hmm. we can never do what it is that He's called us to do, God says, That's the vessel that I will fill. Yes. Hallelujah. Many times God does not begin His work through us until we realize that that work cannot be accomplished in our own strength. He brings us to the end of ourselves so that we can come to the beginning of His purpose and His plan for our lives. And so Paul and Barnabas, they are sent out by the Lord's Spirit to walk in the Lord's purpose. And it is this ministry, a ministry filled with purpose, God's purpose, not just my purpose, but God's purpose. A ministry filled with purpose and power. It is this ministry that the enemy immediately begins to oppose. Yes. Look at verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, that sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, opposed them. It was this ministry, a ministry walking in God's purpose, a ministry filled with God's power. It was this ministry that the enemy immediately began to oppose. Understand The adversary of our soul does not oppose that which has the potential to affect no one. The enemy of your soul, of my soul, he does not oppose that which has the potential to affect no one. That which is powerless and absent of purpose. No, he more fiercely opposes they who have the ability from God to affect the eternal souls of men. Ability from God. Amen. The enemy opposes they who have been given the ability from God to affect the eternal souls of men. Understand Satan's attempt to hinder Paul and Barnabas' ministry was not because of something inherently resident within them. Something special or unique about their persons or their character. His attempt to hinder came because of a recognition of their ability to affect the souls of men who were in his grip. I want to say that again. That Satan's attempt to hinder their ministry was not because of something inherently resident within them. Something special or unique about their persons or their characters. His attempt to hinder came because of a recognition of their ability to affect the souls of men who were in his grip. There were spirits at work everywhere that the early church went. You remember when God begins to use the apostles to take the message of the gospel in Acts chapter 8 and they're opposed by another sorcerer, another false prophet by the name of, 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 of Simon. And so everywhere that early church went, there were demon spirits, spirits of hell, attempting to oppose the work of God and to turn men's minds and hearts away from the gospel message. He attempts, the enemy does, 
to oppose the minister of the gospel in an attempt to blind men and women from seeing their need for Christ. Yes, help us. Look at verse 8. The Bible says that the reason this false prophet opposed Paul and Barnabas was so that he would keep this man who they were ministering to so that he would turn away wow. his heart and his wow. mind from the faith. Right, right. It says that he was seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Mm. Isn't this always his desire? Right, right. The adversaries of our the adversary of our soul keeping men from Jesus Yes, he you. desires to keep men from hearing the gospel preached and seeing the gospel lived through life. Yes, and so he brings distractions, he brings hindrances, he brings obstacles before us so that men might not, their eyes would be blinded to the testimony of Jesus being preached and lived through a life. Help us, Lord. The enemy of our soul attempts to keep uh, 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 keep ministers from preaching and living so that he might keep others from hearing. Yeah. Right. Paul is very clear in Romans chapter 10. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they believe upon the one whom they have not heard? And so if Satan can discourage you and I some kind of way from preaching the gospel and living the gospel in our everyday lives, how will the people that need to hear hear the testimony that they need to hear? How will they hear of Jesus? If we quit living for God altogether and we cease from preaching this gospel, understand if you have experienced the loving kindness of God from on high, if you have met him, you've been redeemed by him, reconciled by him, there is a responsibility yes, given Lord. to you by God to be a minister of reconciliation. Amen. Amen. And Satan wants to oppose that ministry of reconciliation because if he can keep men from hearing, then he can keep men from believing. Right. And if he can keep them from believing, he can keep them from being saved and walking in the power of God's Spirit, and he can keep them from becoming witnesses of Jesus yes. Christ. Right. Help us, Lord. And so Satan... He fiercely, tenaciously, he opposes the ministry of grace. That ministry that offers life, hope, purpose, power, freedom, and salvation in Jesus. Satan opposes that ministry. Yes. Satan never opposed Paul while he was a preacher of the law. Wow. Never. Right. He was on his side. Putting men in bondage, putting men in fear, bringing men into subjection to man's authority and man's power. Satan never opposed that man. Amen. But the moment he began to preach grace and salvation in Jesus alone, he became a man who was opposed. He never opposed Paul while he was a preacher of law. But the moment he became a preacher of grace, that man became a bullseye for the powers of hell, for the hounds of hell. Every step of the way, he opposes Paul as that minister of grace, attempting to thwart the testimony of Jesus from being seen in and through his life. Can I tell you this morning, and I just feel God in this place, Amen. that if we're going to be the vessels and the instruments through which God's grace is revealed and manifest in the world, then we are going to be opposed. Yes. If we are going to be the vessels, the instruments through which God's grace is revealed and manifest to the world, then we are going to be opposed. Powers of darkness always oppose the paths of the righteous. We should not expect or exclaim that the Christian experience is one that is trouble free. Come on. Because such is not the case. Amen. The Christian experience, if you have not figured it out by now, is not one that is without trouble, one that is without trial, one that is without great hardship, difficulty, and even times of great suffering, yeah. times of great sorrow, times of great heartache. Yeah. This is the Christian experience. And I'm not saying that the Christian experience is always there, but the Christian experience is sometimes there. 
sometimes we find ourselves opposed with obstacles put before us, hindrances put into our lives. And the reason that the attacks can become so fierce at times is because what you and I have to offer is so consequential. Yes. This is why these concentrated, conceited attacks of Satan can become so fierce. It's because what you and I have been given by God is not without value, it is not without worth, and it is not without eternal consequence. Oh, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7-9, through 9, that we have this treasure in earthen yes. vessels. The vessel is nothing special. It's just an earthen pot. But within the vessel, hallelujah to God, within the vessel there is a treasure. Yes. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Doesn't matter how, bo- how, how bad the vessel looks, there's a treasure on the inside. Hallelujah. That thing may be hallelujah. I feel God in this place. That vessel may be marred, it may be beat up, and men may look at it and not think much of it. But in that vessel, there is a treasure. And it may be hidden right now, but it will not be hidden forever. The treasure is going to be revealed one way or another. We have a treasure. Thank you, Jesus. I don't care how bad you came into church feeling this morning. If you're saved by the blood of Jesus, you have a treasure within your earthen vessel. And the treasure is Jesus. Yes. I don't care how beat up or down or discouraged or condemned you feel this morning. If you are saved by the blood of Jesus, if you're a child of God, there's a treasure in that vessel. Yes. The person sitting across from you may not be able to see it right now, but one day they'll be able to see the treasure that's on the inside. There's a treasure in that earthen vessel. Hallelujah. There's a treasure in the earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. But watch what Paul says comes. With that, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8, we are troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. We're perplexed, we're persecuted, but not in despair. We're persecuted, opposed, but we are not forsaken. We're cast down, but we are not destroyed. And so with the treasure comes trouble. Understand this. With the treasure comes trouble. But even in our being opposed, we do not have to be overcome. Yes. Even in our being opposed, we do not have to be overcome. Just because I am suffering an attack on my faith presently, it doesn't mean that I am defeated. Yes, in the name of God. Just because I'm fighting the fight of faith and it seems like my hands are getting really heavy, it does not mean that I've lost the battle. Hallelujah. It does not mean that I've thrown in the towel. It doesn't mean that I've lost the fight. Remember what Jesus said, John 16, 33. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Rejoice, for I have overcome Hallelujah. this world. Thank you, Jesus. And if I have overcome, you in me yes. will yes. become an overcomer. Yes. Jesus, I have already Overcome that which opposes you and wars against your soul. I have already overcome it. Therefore, by my name and through my power, you can be an overcomer as well. Paul would say that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. You know what that means? More than conquerors, it means I didn't have to fight the battle. That's right. I'm a conqueror because somebody else fought on my behalf. And he's just given me uh, uh, the opportunity to claim his victory. Hallelujah. He's overcome everything. Everything, think of it, Everything that is opposing you this morning has already been overcome and defeated by Jesus Christ and His cross. Thank you, Jesus. Everything. Everything. That's right. Every spiritual attack that you're facing this morning, every measure of demonic oppression that comes against your life, it has already been overcome and defeated by Jesus at the cross of Calvary. Amen. And that victory was proved when he rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Proved, yes, Lord. They overcame him, Revelation 12 and 11. 
by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. Yes, Lord. What's attempting to overcome you this morning has already been overcome by Jesus. Yes, yes. Lord. Rest in that. Yes. Walk in that. Yes. Believe in that. That which is opposing your life, that which is trying to overcome and overwhelm your life, it has already been overcome and overwhelmed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. He won a battle that we could not win. Yes. Yes. He won the war. The war is over. Oh, it is finished. Yes. What is coming against you has already been defeated in Jesus' name. Yes. And so when these kinds of attacks come, like... They came against Paul and against Barnabas. We need to begin to recognize what they are. And we need to begin to walk in authority yes. Yes. over these yes. things. Yes. Thank now, let's be careful. Because this is not to say that every trial and every test that we face is something that we can just rebuke our way out of. That's not the case. Because there are times when God will allow you to travel through seasons of hardship, even seasons of suffering. The Apostle Peter told us that there's times when God will allow us to suffer for a while. But afterwards, when God brings us out of that, He'll establish us and He'll make us mature and perfect you, in our Lord. faith. And so there are times when God will allow us to endure long seasons of trial and of sufferings. But there are other times when there are simply very quickly can come into our lives these conceited, concentrated attacks of the enemies. At times, they are principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness that are the sole reason for the opposition at hand. And you and I as believers have been given power through Jesus to combat these powers of hell, to be victorious over them. We talked about Ephesians 6 a few moments ago, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. But right before that, Paul tells us that we can be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Yes. That tells us that spiritual attacks will come, but you and I can be victorious over every spiritual attack that comes against us. Yes. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, that we have a responsibility as believers to cast down imaginations and powers that oppose against the knowledge and testimony yes. of Jesus Christ. And so we have a responsibility in the Holy Ghost to recognize these attacks when they come and to walk in victory over them. Yes, Lord. Now keep in mind, Paul and Barnabas were not opposed because they were arrogant or overbearing people. <laughs> come on. This is not why they were opposed. They were opposed simply for the testimony of Jesus. More than one time in this chapter, this false prophet is not the only one that opposes them. There are also religious leaders at the end of Acts 13 that begin to oppose them and begin to threaten their lives. And so they're opposed not because they're arrogant or prideful or self-righteous or overbearing. They're persecuted for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so let's be sure, number one, when we're experiencing opposition and persecution, that we're not being uh, uh, arrogant and prideful in our approach to the gospel, but that we are, in fact, being persecuted for the gospel's sake. Yes, Lord. And here's the beautiful thing. When, not if, but when we are opposed and persecuted for the gospel's sake, we are promised a special empowerment. Of God's Spirit. Oh yes, yes, Lord. Remember in Acts chapter 4, and I'm moving very quickly, I won't read it. Acts chapter 4, the church had just experienced their first major wave of persecution. And some of them, I'm sure, are, are discouraged. I'm sure some of them are experiencing discomfort. Uh, maybe they didn't really realize that this was the kind of opposition that would come against the church. But what you find in Acts chapter 4 are the apostles and the disciples of that early church. They begin to cry out to God and say, God, we've been persecuted. We've been come against. We've been opposed. But God, give us a renewed measure of your spirit and your power. And the Bible says that God honored their prayer and God came down and anointed them afresh 
and anew. Yes. Yes. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so there is victory, there is blessing, and there are eternal rewards offered to those who have this sort of opposition yes. leveled against them. Thank you, Jesus. And so today, if you're experiencing opposition for the sake of the gospel, rejoice. Yes, Lord. There is obstacles that have been thrown in your path. You didn't see them coming. They're trying to overwhelm you and to overcome you. Understand, Jesus promises to you and I a special endowment and equipping of His power to travel through those seasons of opposition and to overcome them. Every attack of the evil one, I'm talking about a true attack <coughs> of Satan, is meant to discourage us from believing in what God is doing in and through us presently and also to disengage us from pursuing what God has for us futuristically in a time yet to come. These attacks are not simply an attempt to hinder us in the moment, but to hinder us from going forward altogether. Yes. Yes. This is what these attacks are arrayed against us for. Not just to stop us in our tracks momentarily, but to hinder us from going forward altogether. Why would the enemy of our souls desire to hinder us from going forward altogether? Because there's somebody on that path of us going forward that needs to see the testimony of Jesus in yes. your life. Yes. And so his attempt is not just to discourage you right now. His attempt is to get you to quit altogether. Yes. Help us, Lord. Because on the path of the righteous are unrighteous men who need to be made righteous in Jesus Christ. Yes. And if you quit right here, there are souls that will spend an eternity in hell because you are the one responsible to bring them the gospel. Help us, Lord. I believe that. I really believe that with all of my heart. Because you and I have been given the supernatural ability to affect the eternal souls of men. Jesus said, Matthew 16 and 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on the earth shall be loosed in the heavens. I know that verse can be misinterpreted and mishandled so many times, but really the context there is Jesus Christ giving His church the power they need to preach the gospel of Christ and to watch men's hearts and lives be set free through that gospel. Yes. Uh -huh. That's really what it is. It's us being given the supernatural ability and power to bring freedom to men's lives. Because men outside of Jesus Christ, just as we were before salvation, are prisoners of Satan. Right. They are prisoners of their own sin, whether they know it or not. They are prisoners and they are in need of being set free. And the church of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Ghost and through the message of the gospel, has been given the ability to unlock those chains and prison doors and to set men free. That's the ability that you and I have been given in Jesus. As we talked about a moment ago, the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. And what I'm so afraid of is that many times the enemy is more aware of what we have the ability to affect than what we are. The enemy of our souls is more aware of the power that we have been given than even what we are. Which is why the attack at times can be so severe because Satan knows what, he, what God has given to us to give to other people. Yeah. And since he couldn't keep us from being saved, he'll keep us from preaching this salvation to keep other men from being yeah. saved. Right. But can I encourage you this morning? Don't allow what the enemy is doing in the present to discourage you from walking toward what God has for you yeah. in your future. Yeah. There are souls at stake. Yeah. You listen, if Paul stops in Cyprus... 
He never reaches the multitudes in Poseidon, Iconium, or Lystra. He never reaches the multitudes in Philippi, Thessalonica, or Corinth. What a tragedy it would have been. What a tragedy it would have been if Paul, instead of recognizing this attack of Satan and walking in authority and victory over it, what if he would have allowed this obstacle to stop him from going forward? He would have never reached the churches at Poseidon, Iconium, or Lystria. He would have never reached the multitudes of men and women in Philippi, Thessalonica, or Corinth. What a tragedy it would have been. And today we would be here with no epistles of Paul. Today we would be here with no book of Thessalonica, no book of Philippians, no book of Corinthians, because one obstacle and means of opposition stopped him in his tracks. What story has yet to be written through your life? That's good. Preaching. Yeah. That Satan wants to keep from being written. What story has yet to be written through your life? That if you stop, will not be written. No, Paul, he recognizes this attack for what it really is. Naya, would you come and just begin to play something softly, please? Paul recognizes this attack for what it is. And I won't read back through it. Verses 6 through 13. And he responds to this spirit. And Paul tells that spirit, no. This spirit of hell is not going to disrupt what God is trying to do. Amen. It will not discourage me from my purpose. Or cause me to disengage from the work of God. It may hinder me momentarily, but it will not stop me altogether. I have something to give. I have something to offer. And can I encourage you this morning? I don't know what you may be facing or going through, but I just feel that God has sent me here with a word from heaven this morning to stir your heart to fresh fresh faith and encouragement in your God. And can I just tell you this morning, go on, child of God. Stand in the victory that Jesus died to give you. Stand in the victory and the authority that Jesus Christ gives us to walk over in power over every principality and power of hell and walk today in the purpose that God has ordained for your life. Hallelujah. If Paul stops here, you read on. You read at the end of Acts 13 about a revival that begins to take place in the Gentiles. Sure, most of the Jews persecute them, but the Gentiles begin to get saved and redeemed by the multitudes. But if Paul stops right here, there's no salvation, there's no freedom, there's no liberty, there's no revival. If he stops right here, what does God want to do through your life? Amen. And if you stop now, it will not happen. I'm not saying that everything God allows into our lives is good or it feels good or it's nice or it's bubbly because sometimes it's not. But we have this promise that all things work together for good. To them who love God, watch this, and to them who are the called according to His purpose. You know what that tells me? That tells me that if I become a cooperator with God, a co-laborer with God in His purpose, which is the glorifying of His Son, then it doesn't matter what comes my way, it will work together for my good and for God's glory. All things that you see right now may not be good. I get that. I acknowledge that. I know. I know what it is to be there. God's promise to you is if you'll walk in my power, you'll walk in my purpose, I'll take everything that you're facing right now and I'll use it for your good and I'll use it to glorify my name. That's God's promise to you. That's not Ross's promise to you. That's not Ross's proclamation. That's God's proclamation. Paul was offering, you read it at the end of Acts 13, he's offering forgiveness and freedom Jesus, that's why he's opposed. That's why he's attacked. It's because he's offering total freedom and forgiveness in Jesus. He's bringing to the world a message that they desperately need. And listen, there's a world out there who's lost and who's dying and who needs the message of the gospel. 
They need men and women who are willing to go and to tell them about Jesus. And in that journey, we're going to be opposed, guys. But these are obstacles that can and are meant to be overcome. Don't be overwhelmed by this thing. Allow the Spirit of God in you to overcome and to overwhelm that thing which has come against your life. I just want to read that this was the culmination of Paul's message. And it's the culmination of our message today. Verses 38 and 39, Paul would say after he preaches to the next city, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, speaking of Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and that by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. The word justified there in Acts 13 and 39, it doesn't refer to just the mere declaration of innocence, but it refers to the liberation from sin which hold man, holds man a prisoner. One version says, By Him, by Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from everything that you could not be free from through the law of Moses. Yes, He opposes us because of this, but there's victory in Jesus. Would you stand with me?